Okay, so everybody, everybody knows that the best way to extend lifespan and health span is calorie restriction. And almost everybody knows that calorie restriction is a non-starter um, as a as a useful method. Even my friend Walter Longo knows that calorie restriction isn't going to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody will do it. It's miserable. Yeah, uh, you, yeah, you'll feel miserable. I mean, the Biosphere Two project showed that, right? Yeah, yeah. And actually, his mentor was Ray Walford, um, who uh, was a pathologist from UCLA. And uh, Ray thought this was the greatest thing that ever happened to his research because these guys literally starved to death. Uh, they lost uh, 30% of their body weight in the first six months. And their organs shrunk as well, right? Everything everything went bad. Yeah. Um, but And sadly, Ray Wolford, who was really the father of calorie restriction, uh, died as what I consider a young man in his 70s. And since I'm now in my 70s, I consider that a young man. Yeah. So that, that's not a good idea. But DeCapo said, you know, I think we've got this all wrong. Calorie-restricted animals are profoundly hungry and for obvious reasons. And in experiments, we control when their food is put out. And I have a feeling that when you're really hungry and somebody puts your bowl of food in your cage, you're going to eat it really quickly. And then you have to wait till the next day for the next bowl of food. So he designed an experiment that took the rhesus monkey studies from the University of Wisconsin and the National Institutes of Aging and designed a study to see if it was really the calorie restriction or it was the time of feeding that made the difference. And what he found, I'll really summarize it quickly, if you take animals and give them a full day's calories, but put it out at three o'clock in the afternoon, they'll eat it actually fairly quickly. And they'll go a very long time, about 12 hours without eating, which for a rat is a very long time. Yeah. If you give animals kind of food throughout the 24 hours, the same amount of food, they'll kind of nibble on it all day and all night. So when he looked at metabolic flexibility, which kind of started our conversation, only the animals that were given their food at three o'clock in the afternoon and ate it fairly quickly had metabolic flexibility. They could change from glucose to free fatty acid. The animals that ate all day and night didn't have any metabolic flexibility. Point number one. Number two, the animals that had their time-restricted eating uh, lived 11% longer than the animals who ate the same amount of food but ate it throughout the day. For humans, that's a 10-year benefit. Amazing. And the really cool thing is the animals with the time-restricted eating didn't develop amyloid plaques in their organs or their brain. And these animals tend to die of liver cancer, interestingly enough, and they have far less liver cancer. So that's now been proven in humans with the Italian athlete study, which I profile in this book, which I think is... You know, humans want to know about humans. And what's, yeah. Really, yeah, what's, what's really exciting is you, you take t- Italian cyclists and you put them on a training table where everybody has to eat the exact same food. And you do a three-month study. And all you do is change time of eating. So one group, they eat breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning. They eat lunch at uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And they have dinner at uh, 8 o'clock at night. Sorry, lunch at one o'clock in the afternoon. Eight one eight. Eight one eight. Twelve hour eating window. Sounds normal. The other group eats break fast breakfast at one o'clock in the afternoon. Has lunch four o'clock in the afternoon. Has to finish dinner at eight o'clock. Seven hour eating window. Followed for three months. The punchline is only the athletes in a seven hour eating window lost weight. They actually lost a lot of weight. The 12 hour guys didn't change their weight. Hmm. They had identical athletic performance. And here's the best part the athletes on the 12 hour eating window had a normal insulin like growth factor one, IGF one. The athletes on the seven hour window plummeted their insulin like growth factor one. And if you follow me in other research, IGF one is probably our only decent measurement of mTOR activation. And 
people, super old people in my practice and other practices have really low IGF-1s. And people with really high IGF-1s, number one, don't live very long. Mm -hmm. and they get builders. Old. Yeah, bodybuilders. Thanks for that. And they get a lot of cancer, folks. Yeah. And we see that in my practice all the time. In fact, it's amazing the number of people with cancer who have elevated insulin levels and elevated insulin-like growth factors. Mm -hmm. These are growth hormones. Yeah. And there's nothing in us we want to grow once we're grown. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> So, I mean, that's so exciting that here's a human study that actually, you know, proves uh, DeCapo's research that, son of a gun, it's restricting the time of eating. So now let's get back to ketones. So what's happening? So a normal person, and these athletes are normal people, they, you know, they've got metabolic flexibility. They would start making ketones eight hours after they stopped eating. And they'd ramp up their ketone production at about 12 hours. But the athletes who are waiting till one o'clock in the afternoon, they've got another five hours of ketone production compared to the athletes that broke their fast at eight o'clock in the morning. So five so, more hours of mitochondrial uncoupling. Um, bingo, which now explains why those guys got what got weight loss. And it now explains why their insulin-like growth factors actually improve. Interesting. Yeah. And so it, it all, when you start looking at this, go, son of a gun, that's how this works. That's, I always want to find out the mechanism. You know, I can, for instance, when we started this years ago, we all knew that hormesis was really good for you. That which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. We had no idea why that was, we knew it existed. Uh, I suspect Hippocrates had no idea why all disease begins in the gut. Maybe he knew. <laughs> we now know why he was right, but it's the same thing with hormesis. It turns out, and the book talks about this, all these things that are hormetic foods or hormetic practices all come together in just one thing. They all uncouple mitochondria. And that's actually what's so cool. And so cool. Yeah, so fascinating. <laughs> we, and I talk a lot about hormesis, but now I'm viewing it from an entirely different lens, thanks to you. Um, so that is so just the awareness for those listening and watching right now. Like this might be the reason why you can't lose weight on keto. This might be the reason why you don't feel great on keto and why you're struggling. It's, it's all about the mitochondrial uncoupling. So let's talk about – I know your book has several ways – to do this, but I want to, I want to talk about a few of them, right? So I have a few of my notes here. My favorite is the MCTs, right? And I love, and I didn't realize this. I learned this from your book, but it's funny because I've been telling all my students to add more sheep and goat dairy and get rid of the cow dairy. And I found out through your book that 30% of sheep and, cow, uh, and goat dairy is MCT. So yeah. explain that, how that helps. Yeah. So it, it turns out, you know, so MCTs are this really cool fat that aren't absorbed in the way normal fats are. They go directly through the wall of our intestine to our liver, where they are automatically converted into ketones. So number one, you could have insulin resistance. You could have metabolic inflexibility. You could take four weeks to generate ketones by following a ketogenic diet. Or... Or you could take MCTs and generate ketones. And it's been shown in humans, and I document the studies, that a tablespoon of MCT oil will have you within a half an hour generating adequate amounts of ketones to begin uncoupling mitochondria. So what better way than, you know, if MCTs are easy to take, you can mix it in salad dressing, folks. Uh, some women, really, you got to go slow, quite frankly. A lot of my female patients, liquid the MCT. Stomach. stomach. Yeah, and, I see and that diarrhea. Too. Yeah. Interestingly enough, in my practice, uh, I see that the powdered MCTs work better for women. And there's a number of MCT powders out there. Uh, we put them in the women's coffee, and that seems to work well. But you can get a lot of MCTs by having goat or sheep yogurt or goat and sheep cheese. 
Now, here's one. It didn't make it into the book. I, I wish I fought for it. Um, Let's share we, it now. Well, we all know about blue zones, thanks to Dan Butner. And quite frankly, I'm the only nutritionist who spent most of my career living in a blue zone, Loma Linda, California. That's so right. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but. So two of the blue zones are quite interesting. Sardinia and the Nagoyan Peninsula of Costa Rica. And Dan makes a big point that they eat a lot of bread and grains. The, the Nagoyan Peninsula eats a lot of corn and beans, and he makes a case that it's the beans and corn. Well, not so fast. It turns out Sardinia has two regions, the mountainous region and down by the coast, and kind of nothing in between. It's only the folks who live in the mountainous region that have extended longevity. So what do those guys do up there? turns out they're goat and sheep herders. Hmm. The folks down by the Mediterranean Sea are not goat and sheep herders, and they don't eat goat and sheep cheese. They eat fish. So when there's papers published that the longevity benefit is from the MCTs from the goat and sheep cheese uncoupling their mitochondria, and they don't get it in the, in the, in the sea. Let's go to the Nagoyan Peninsula. All of Costa Ricans eat a lot of beans and corn. That's their diet. What's so unique about the Nagoyan Peninsula? Want to guess? They're, go they're goat and sheep herders. And there's a beautiful paper showing that the benefit of the goat and sheep cheeses and yogurts offset the bad part of the corn and beans. So here we have two blue zones that actually we can attribute their longevity to the goat and sheep cheese. Other fun fact, when I moved to Loma Linda, I was shocked that the Adventist diet is 50% fat. And most of the fat comes from cheeses. Uh, fun fact, who knew? So, uh, but at least two of them are goat and sheep cheese um, mm -hmm. that are the, are, they're actually causing the benefit. That's so interesting. Oh, man. I mean, we have just like seven minutes to go. I could talk to you for hours. In your book, you also talk about other MCTs, or I should say um, other ways. Un uncoupling. Un uncoupling, yeah, which is interesting. The book title is great, and it is about keto, but it could essentially be called, you know, uncoupling and learning all about the mitochondria. You could have, like, changed the title and talked about that. True, true story. I really wanted this title to be uh, – the title was going to be – the key to life comes down to just one thing and mm. it's not what you think mm. and it's uncoupling. Yeah. And you're right. Uh, this, this is a longevity book hidden in a keto book. And I think that's why you and me probably are so excited about the benefits of ketones and a ketogenic diet. But I think this book takes it to the next level because what I want for people and what I've based my career is I want you to have a diet you can live with literally and figuratively. And I think you and I know that for so many people, particularly I take care of a lot of vegetarians and vegans and a ketogenic diet is basically a non-starter for all of them. Mm -hmm. But you can get all the benefits that ketones bring you with lots of other ways to accomplish the same thing. For instance, I'm uncoupling my mitochondria right now. I have a big glass of tea. And tea is actually a great mitochondrial uncoupler. Coffee is a yeah. great mitochondrial uncoupler. Uh, extra dark chocolate, great mitochondrial uncoupler. In fact, so many of the things that we think of as healthy, uh, when you actually look at the literature, their mechanism of action is uncoupling mitochondria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have an entire list of your book of other. I'm yeah. not going to give. I'm not going to give it away. But I know few. there's there's plenty. Um, before we wrap up the conversation, I want to touch upon melatonin real quick, and then I want to talk about why we see insulin resistance with long term ketosis. So melatonin is another way. You said it's one of the two antioxidants that have the ability to actually penetrate the mitochondria membrane. Are you putting glutathione in the same category of, as superoxide dismutase? Uh, yeah, it's it's in the same category. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, melatonin, you also have a list of melatonin foods that you could eat. And, and what about supplementation with melatonin? What are your thoughts on that? 
That's a great question. Uh, first of all, pistachios actually have the highest melatonin content of any food. There's actually some interesting research that I cite that the Mediterranean diet and the French paradox actually get their benefit by the melatonin content of mm -hmm. olive oil and red wine and also actually mushrooms are full of melatonin. And, and I argue, vitamin B, yeah. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I argue in the book that we've, um, we've associated melatonin with a sleep hormone, but in fact, melatonin comes out at night because it is the major mitochondrial repair hormone, antioxidant. And so it's there at night, not to put you to sleep, but to actually repair mitochondria. If you found this video helpful, I think you're going to love this one. Diabetes plummeted around the world, in the United States, in England, in Denmark, and heart disease plummeted around the world for five years during World War II.